gliding or having the car you hang glide with. I think having the car you hang glide with isn't much fun. Yeah. Feels just like a regular Volkswagen until you stand on it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage. The vehicle we're featuring today appears to be a 1971 Volkswagen van. You might say that's not so special. Well, it's very, very special because this vehicle belongs to a very special guy who's done an incredible amount of very special work to it. Uh, we're always thrilled when automotive royalty comes by and this guy is right at the top of the heap designing the Corvette Stingray, Carroll Shelby, the Cobras, Mr. Peter Brock. Peter, come on in, my friend. Good to see you. Always a pleasure. Gosh, yeah. How are you? Oh, we love having you. <laughs> now, to the uninitiated, what's that? It's a 71 Volkswagen, but you don't have anything normal, so <laughs> tell us what we have here. This is absolutely the greatest vehicle provided you were a hang glider pilot. Okay, so you're a hang glider pilot. We had the largest uh, hang glider manufacturing in the world, and we won the world championship six times in a row. But what enabled us to do it was this very special vehicle, because most people are not aware that hang gliders fly anywhere from five to 15,000 feet, and right. they fly hundreds of miles. Right. And in the competition, it's a week long, and you have to be able to get up these dirt fire roads up in the Owens Valley. Mm -hmm. The competition is usually held up in the Owens Valley between the White Mountains and the Sierras. Right. And uh, to get to the top of these mountains, you have to have a real good off-road vehicle. There's hardly anything as good as the Volkswagen. The problem is they just didn't have enough power. Well, that's for me now. The Volkswagen said, <laughs> what was this, 36 horsepower, maybe 48 or something yeah, at that, that point? Yeah, So how does one solve the horsepower problem? Well, the way I usually do it is I put a GM V8 engine in it, <laughs> and it's uh, just made it an incredible vehicle. I, we've got thousands and thousands of miles on this thing now. It's just been so reliable, but it's uh, probably more fun than anything because anybody who's got a Volkswagen van, when you right. meet them on the highway, everybody wants to race a right. little bit, right, right. and then we finally get in high gear and just disappear. <laughs> okay, so tell them, like, see, I look, look at this. He, 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 he's, he's 18 years old again. This is yeah, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Really a fun, fun piece. Now, was this built, you, you built this quite a while back oh, in the day, yeah, right? Yeah, this was back, uh, back in the days when we were flying hang gliders, right. you know. But I mean, back in the day, as in with it Shelby and those, was this built at his shop? No, we built it at our shop, uh, oh, okay. uh, which was uh, BRE, but before that was really the UP Hang Glider Company, which is the largest hang glider company in the world. Okay, so that explains why you have these racks on here. Right, and okay. you'll notice that these are aerodynamically I saw that, beautiful. it looks like a wing, yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, to support the hang gliders when you're on there, because they're about 18 feet long when right. you're traveling them. So you throw all the team gliders up on the top of this, put the whole crew in the back here, and go up the mountains till you get up to about six, 7,000 feet, and that's where you launch. But you only can put one plane on at a time, right? Oh, no, no, because they're all, they're all folded up. They weigh about 98 to 100 pounds each. Oh, okay. And uh, we probably have about four guys flying for us, so throw them all on the top up there. Wow, yeah. okay, yeah. all right. Now, it is, it's still rear wheel drive, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. And well, dumb question, the engine is in the rear. Absolutely. So you want to keep some Volkswagen y thing to it. Well, yeah. it just, it, it, there was a very popular thing at the time to put uh, all kinds of uh, engines in VWs. Right. So there were people out there that made all the adapters that put in. So it's quite an easy thing. The only trick, of course, is that it's water cooled. Right. So we had to run some pipes up into the front and put a big radiator up in the front. Now, did you run electric water pumps as well? Or no, just standard water pump and, and, and everything. And, and yeah. did it, okay, because, yeah. you know, I showed you the Merlin that we built over there. Oh, and God. we had to run electric water pumps just to keep the flow the going. Flow going. Yeah, yeah. So I think traveling this great distance yeah. with that water pump, it's more than enough, huh? More than enough, right. Okay. Now, is that why, is, is, is this for real? Is this actually? Yeah, that's the high, high spot to fill it. Okay. Because so you, you want to have it, you get all the air out of it, so you want to have the high right. spot to fill it. So it's the only car where you fill a radiator from inside. Inside, the car. right. <laughs> okay. Put the hose in there, and then you're all yeah. set. Okay. So everything is uh, very, very practical. So this is a 71. You didn't buy it new, did you? No, I think we bought it used, but we had another one before that, but this one has disc brakes on it. This okay. is the first year with the disc brakes, so okay. that's the 
uh, primary thing on a, on a little performance because the thing is will easily cruise all day long at 90 and right. just it's been a fabulous thing. Most people don't know, you know, because I'm interested in aerodynamics. Right. One of the interesting things is that the coefficient of drag on a Volkswagen bus is better than an E Jag coupe. Is that right? Yeah. No, well, the, uh, I'm guessing <laughs> it's, let me take a guess at what the drag is 0.36. I think you're about right. Is that yes. about right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I get it. Like, to me, a Volkswagen Beetle is more aerodynamic than a Countach. The Countach is yeah. like 0.49 or some crazy they thing. really get up there. Yeah, yeah. something yeah. like that. Because it's literally a brick because the front is like this. So, right. Yeah. You know. Now, obviously, the Jag in, in overall, because you've got to multiply the frontal area of the vehicle by the coefficient of drag. Right. So the Jag is a little bit better when you do that. The right. actual number of shape, this is actually a superior shape to the Jaguar. And that's uh, most people didn't understand that you know that very flat roof line, the very flat side lines. It looks like a brick, really. It doesn't look yeah. aerodynamic at all. I know, uh, but it's okay. very efficient, actually. All right. Now, tell me about this particular model of Volkswagen. I, this would have been what a service van. Yes. This would have yep. been for the commercial use, that kind right. of thing. Because these are fairly rare, aren't they? You don't see as many. Most of the popular ones, of course, are all of the, you know window vans you know up to 23 windows on them right i remember the the they had seats front and back and an open bed too that was right. popular for yeah. a lot of plumbers and guys like that had those yeah okay they're very very versatile uh i think that uh, uh the, the really fun thing about it is it just it didn't really have the power and speed for the american market right and by putting that buick in the back <laughs> yeah. Man, it just, it made it such a lovely, lovely vehicle. Did you guys ever get approached by Volkswagen? Yes, we have seen that you have done. It's very good. Very interesting. <laughs> you know, I, because like the English, they took to the, to the Sunbeam Tiger and the Cobra and the, the Gordon Keeble and yeah. all of those cars. But the Germans never quite caught on with They never, no. I, I don't think so. We were, I mean, we were mostly in the mountains, hidden away, flying hang gliders, right. you know, all the way to, from here to nowhere. And uh, that's where this thing really shines because, boy, you could just go up these fire roads that, you know, normally you'd take a Jeep or something right. like that. And this thing, uh, that all that experience, of course, came from uh, racing in Baja. Right. And uh, so many great uh, Baja cars have been built off of Volkswagens. So just taking all of that experience that we had in Baja and putting it into this with a big vote motor in it made it really ideal. I would say most people watching this website know you, of course, for your automotive work. Yeah. Because with the Cobra and the Corvettes and everybody. But obviously you make trailers too, right? Yes, we make trailers okay. today, yeah. Right. Aerovault okay. trailers, uh, aerodynamic. Right. And uh, very lightweight. And uh, they're, again, uh, very efficient to probably about 15% more efficient than a square Now, front. when you design an aerodynamic trailer, is it different than designing a car because you have a vehicle in front? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. What you're trying to do, because every car that you're going to tow with is different, so it's going to disturb the air that comes back to the trailer. So what you want to do with the trailer is you want to collect all that turbulent air right. and attach it back to the body and keep it attached so that it goes through as smoothly as possible. Gotcha. So on our trailer, the whole front end is completely rounded and the top is rounded. So it has a, a whole bullet shape on the front and that just collects all that turbulent air on it and smooths it all the way back. And the other advantage of it, because it's fairly round, is that when you're in a crosswind, it's not affected at all. Right. Or when you've got a big 40 footer coming at you that normally, if you've got a square front trailer, it'll set you over a couple of feet on gotcha, the road. Gotcha. Can't even feel it with these things. It just stabilizes everything. Very cool. Yep. Well, let's get back. Let's walk around <coughs> this a, a yeah. minute. For example, you very, cl what is the transmission, by the way? Well, it's a standard transmission, but again, we've got so many good people. Volkswagen out here. transmission? Volkswagen transmission but it's beefed up a little bit because okay. of all the experience that we've had in Baja. Right. You just build it up a little heavier and it just, it's held up beautifully. Well, how do you build it up heavier? You can't make the cases stronger, right? You don't make the, the gears are the same. What, all that's the same on it, but some of the gears are a little bit stronger oh, okay. it, on the ratio change and uh, superior bearings and stuff right. on oh, the okay. inside. Yeah. But other than that, it's pretty much stock. You know, you look at a Hewling gearbox for race cars, they're right. all originally built out of Volkswagens. Oh, okay. Yep. Cool. You yeah. very cleverly blacked out the radiator here. Yeah, that's so, a little styling touch there, so, so you, you got don't a notice what's going on. Big radiator in there. Uh, and that's enough to cool it, obviously. What's that out of? G 
GM truck? No, I think uh, we just had a custom built radiator oh, okay. Okay. built up at the time on it just so that it fit on it. Okay. But, uh, yeah, everything here is pretty well. Obviously, you've, you've welded these into the roof. Nice job there, by the way. Everything goes right down on the A pillar, so there's a lot of strength in it because you're carrying all oh, of that okay. weight up on the top. And of course, on the real rough roads uh, all around, uh, everything has to be super strong. Right, okay. And this normally would have been chrome when it was new, correct? No, 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 no not uh, the, all the standard of. PW stuff is all painted. Oh, okay. You know, some of the people have, you know, put chrome there on the on the later stuff, but they're very, very understated as a as a as a commercial vehicle. And of course, you got your, your Recaro seats and the dash. Now, somebody signed the dash. Whose signature is that? I don't know. Some idiot put his name on there. Peter Brock. Oh, that's that. your name. That is yeah, why right. I thought it was your name. But <laughs> why would you sign your own car? Well, because I gave this to my son, and oh, he I has see. kept it in beautiful shape all these oh, years. Oh, okay. I've got to say And that. Uh, he's sort of proud of it, so I signed it for oh, him. Oh, no. Well, that's it. Well, that's a very yeah. big of you there. Yeah. Yeah. That's it right now. I guess he signs his own car. Okay. Very funny. Like with Carol Shelby. I mean, when people show me, they always show me, the, Carol Shelby signed this Mustang. I always say to him, you know, the rare ones are the unsigned. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. Because <laughs> Carol loves to sign <laughs> Everything you know. in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rare one is the unsigned. That's the one that's worth the money. He's try and find one of those babies. You know. <laughs> okay, let's walk around the back. Let's show you uh, what you've been waiting to see, how we got this Buick in here. Come on, All come right. around the back. I like the very subtle uh, air scoop there. Was, is that what, oil cooler? Was it just definitely put an oil cooler. It's an aircraft oil cooler that's all built into the side. And again, even the, if you look there, the uh, work on the fenders and stuff to put the big tires in, it's kept as subtle as possible. Oh, so yeah, the metal work is really nicely done. Oh, it's you, beautiful. Yeah. That was all done by George Boscoff, who was our head fabricator at, at BRE and also one of the top guys at Shelby's. And he's probably best known uh, as the guy that first put the V8 in the production Alpine to make the Sunbeam oh, Tiger. Oh, Sunbeam Tiger. I had right. a Sunbeam Tiger. To me, we used to call it the poor man's Cobra, you know, back in the it day. Was. It was. But I remember, I think it was October 64, Hot Rod Magazine, that whole thing on putting a V8 in an Alpine, you know, one of those right. deals. Yeah. And, it, yeah, and that was like, oh, I have to go back and look at the picture now and check that um, out and see. His yeah. work was just beautiful. Uh, he used to build all the headers for all of our race cars. And the wonderful thing about headers is they're very difficult usually to change between practice and a race if you right. got to change engines. And because they get so much heat to them, they want to distort. Right. You could take a set of George's headers, a car would come in steaming hot, guys with gloves on them, pull those headers off, put a new engine back in, and everything would just slide together beautifully. Wow. That's the quality of his work. Wow, that's pretty it cool. beautiful, beautiful work. Yeah, so many legendary guys from back in that day. I mean, yeah. it, even this, when you got rid of it, was it just a used car at that point? I mean, it's become an iconic vehicle. People yeah. who, who sort of, not only collect VWs, but Shelby and your history and all that, it makes it a really valuable vehicle. Well, did, especially with guys like George Boscoff that worked on it, who yeah. did all the engine install for us at, uh, uh, when we did this all at BRE, it was amazing. And you said that Ken Miles, he was the one that... He did the very first one when the uh, program came to Roots. Um, I think it was Ian Garrod uh, from Roots uh, had the idea of putting the V8 in there and he had Ken Miles do the very first one. Ken Miles had a shop in Hollywood and he put it in really quick, dirty, and then that enabled uh, Garrett to sell that project to Roots. Right. And at that point, they said, great, let's do a real production one. And then they brought it over to Shelby's, and George did all of the production work on it so that it could be copied in production. Oh, well, that's really cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's take a look now at uh, all right. what we this have here. All right, this is uh, really interesting to see because the engine is mounted just like it. you put the Volkswagen oh, engine oh, in. Oh, look it. at that. Yeah, OK. But other than that, it's just a uh, regular stock uh, Buick engine in there. And how much heavier is this than the Volkswagen engine? I think we're about 125 pounds heavier oh, okay. on it. Okay. And I'll tell you, after I did I was kind of concerned about having this amount of weight in the back. Right. And it, you can't even feel it in there. If I had it to do over again, I'd put an aluminum Chevy in it with more power. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, this well, thing is so you know, yeah. It's not too late, you know. It's not too late. You know, you can still do that. <laughs> But very cool. Well, but, this is the legendary engine that went into Rover. Yes. And the uh, uh, 
all, all the British cars, I think. Who yeah. else used it? Well, you used it in the Rover uh, 2000, I think it was. Yep. Well, the sedan, and then, of course, uh, but the, they're start using the it all over in England. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of the most popular yeah. V8s in, in England. Yeah, very cool. But if you see all the really neat stuff, like, you know, look at all these little bracketry holding all this stuff. Yeah. Really beautifully done. Nice brackets. Just everything. I know fits that looks like. Nice. Look at that. That looks like a factory piece of some kind. Right. That's George's work, you know, yeah. on the stuff. That, everything that went in here. It's just. And what kind of horsepower are you making? Oh, I don't think it made. You know, maybe a couple hundred, something like that. Yeah. But just, yeah. Just uh, not not really hot rodded at all. It's it, it, the main advantage is it had a lot of torque and uh, stayed really cool climbing up through the mountains. Well, so sure. Plus, with those long runners too, you're getting that much more. Yep. Probably an extra on. gallon or two of uh, a coolant in it. But as well. when you when you put all the guys in, you know, and all their gear on top, and all of their stuff, and then uh, they take off and you know circle up maybe 12,000 feet or so, and then head off cross country, whatever the through. Then this had to go down and stay in touch with them on the radio and chase them across the desert right, to right. wherever they were and pick them up and then run them home at night and get them sleep. And that's the way we won the championships. Wow. See, that's a whole part of history I didn't know. And this opens as well, correct? Yep. Well, as you said, you can see it's not a show car. You can see this has been... All this all covered. All, all the... Uh, the metal struts went down on the right. inside. You can see on the inside they're all welded. Everything is, you know, really, really made so that you can get at it. Yeah, but it was just basically a big box to put all the gear in to get it to the top of the mountain. Yeah. And again, it wasn't built to be a fast car or a show car. It was just built to be a work car. So wasn't right. It? Yeah. Exactly. And for that, it's been just a fabulous, fabulous vehicle for the whole now, time. Now, did you sell it, or did you give it to your son, or did he? I gave it to my son. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. My son Ian has had it all the time. And, and it was actually pretty kind of beat up by the time we finished it. And he's taken it and really cleaned it all up and taken such good care of it. Uh, it's uh, really kind of a family heirloom. He's got two boys now that love it as well, so it'll probably stay in the family for a while. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've had you've had it since, what, 73, right? Yes, right. Yeah. That's when we started BRE. Very cool. Very cool. But the great thing about it, uh, you know, for the guys, you, you, you can put their bikes inside, the motorcycles inside. I mean, right. it's the, the best all-around uh, sport utility vehicle. I know. You know <laughs> I just noticed this. I, know how it, I see it across. It enters there and the Right, cool that's all the ducting again, all the sort of George's beautiful work again to get the air in and out of the oil cooler. That's the main thing. Is I've always uh, think that's the best thing you can do for an engine is make sure that the, uh, you keep the oil temperature probably about 218 degrees. Right. That's just above boiling. That means if any water at all gets in the oil, it's all evaporated and you don't end up with any acidic stuff gotcha. in the oil. Okay. And it just lasts for hundreds of thousands yeah. of miles. Good to know. And of course, Way bigger than stock tires. Yep. Uh, yeah, nicely done. Well, pretty cool. Can we take it for a ride? Absolutely. Let's You're going to enjoy it. driving. Oh, this I'm going to enjoy it. Let's do it. All Not right. Not do any hang gliding, but let's do it. <laughs> it's been a while since I drove one of these. Now they're caros or not. Boy, the clutch is easy enough. Feels just like a regular Volkswagen until you stand on it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it goes good. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, very nice. Oh, it's got plenty of power in every gear. Oh, though. yeah. I mean, it really made it such a usable vehicle. Yeah, it's yeah, funny. Nothing horsepower won't fix. So you still hang gliding? No, I haven't done that for years. I ruined my back moving furniture and I can't yeah. carry a glider anymore, but it's absolutely the most fun thing I've ever done. Oh, that's great. And, uh, but I had all the top guys in the world flying for us on our team. Yeah. And then we flew all over the world. We went to Europe and, and won the America's Cup over there. Went to South America and Argentina, everything. Uh, just an amazing uh, world in itself that most people are not aware of, you know, because everything's occurring up in the sky, so nobody knows much about it, but it's an amazing experience. 
passport. I suppose you could have started with an Econoline van or something. That already had to well, be Well, the thing in. is, they don't work in the day, you know, to climb all the mountains oh, and right, stuff. Right. You know, that's what the Volkswagen was so right. good for, you know. Right, I mean, yeah. that's where you learned so much in Baja, taking all this stuff and be able to run it off road and carry everything. It was just, there isn't anything in the world that beats this particular vehicle for this purpose. You know, guys, got they got big four-wheel drive trucks and jeeps and whatever, and they can just go by anybody up the roughest roads. It's amazing. Now, why'd you pick the Buick uh, V8? Why not the, uh, you know, one of the Corvette motors, 283 Chevy? Well, we were trying to keep it as light as possible. Oh, okay. You know, and this is the lightest. I was V8. concerned about the weight in the back. Yeah. After we had experience with it, I would have gone with a aluminum Chevy, uh, just so it had more cubes on it and. Uh, it's easier to get parts for and that sort of thing. Did you so. see my Tatra, the green one? No, I didn't see that. That has a Tatra. magnesium air cooled overhead cam. Yes, today. yeah, I'm familiar with them. Yeah, they're, they're fabulous. It's got to be a lot lighter than this. Probably. Yeah. Well, Hans Ledinka was really way ahead of the game, you know. Yeah. And Porsche copied a lot of stuff on it. I think he's the only guy that successfully sued Porsche and win. I think so, yeah. yeah. You know the name uh, Paul Jure? Paul Jure? Oh, yeah, the Aaron yeah, okay. Amos. The yeah. Amos, you know, because it's very interesting because he, you know, went to work for Zeppelin and. Uh, right, he did the Tatra. Yeah, he did the Tatra. That's what made I me think, think that has a coefficient of 0.27. I know. Can you imagine that? Well, there's no downforce, so it's all just. Yep, all yeah. airflow. You know, it's a wonderful car to drive because yep. it was guaranteed to get 20 miles per gallon at 60 miles an hour. Isn't that which amazing? in 38 was. Oh, fabulous. Impressive. But the interesting thing is that the guy that that, that did all the, the, the aero work with uh, Bunabal Kahn, a guy named Reinhard Koenig von Faschenfeld, he worked for Paul Jure at uh, at the Zeppelin factory. He was an apprentice oh, to Paul right? Jure, yeah. so he was influenced by that. And then he figured out that Jure really didn't have the answer because he, it was great at the, at the taper for a Zeppelin, but when you put it on an automobile, it didn't work. So he started working with the flat roof and chopping it off. And it was their studies, of course, that went in. Everybody calls it the calm tail. Yeah. But it was really fine and hard. Couldn't even watch and build it. Uh, figured all that stuff out and made it work so well. I'm surprised Volkswagen transmission can take the tour. Oh, just held up with no problem at all. So is there any car you're looking for? Any car from history you wish you had? What, what do you... What, what design do you pick as one of the great designs? You know, I mean, if I if I could own sort of any car that I wanted, you know, I think I'd own Mozart's HC2900. Oh, and that's you something. Know, that yeah. car, to me, I think it's one of the, you know, great all time. It's so beautiful. Every piece is done. So aesthetically beautiful. Victorio Yano designed that one, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. With the twin superchargers. And everything. But I mean, the way every part is made, it's just a piece of art everywhere. And it was so interesting because that was that was the first car built. And I guess an American guy ordered the car. And after it was built, they showed it. And he, it took him a couple of years for the factory to finally give it to him. <laughs> yeah. You don't appreciate good design until you see bad design. Oh, so much crap. You know, part of it is we got into the age of computers. The fact is you can do anything and everybody's working in two dimensions. And you don't have a chance to do stuff three dimensionally and work on the clay and do everything. So that whole sculptural quality that the top guys, you know, had. I mean, there were some really great guys at GM that did some beautiful stuff there that, you know, we never saw on the road. It was amazing. Yeah. So tell me about the hang gliding. It seems, you know, I like old motorcycles, old cars, where the penalty for error is, oh, yeah. good, 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 you pull off the side of the road, okay, maybe. You know, maybe you hit a tree on a bad day. Yeah. Hang gliding, the penalty seems somewhat excessive. Have you well, I think the prob problem is, is people don't understand, you know, they, they get so enthralled with the ability to fly that they don't understand right. what's happening with the weather around you, whatever. You know, you're not just 50 feet off the ground, you're hundreds, thousands of feet up. Right, right. And, uh, you know, 
it's pretty amazing. You'll be flying along and you'll look out there and you'll see a giant airplane coming at you. <clears throat> I did this going cross country once going over to Riverside. <laughs> and you've never seen a C-130 look as big as it does when it flies underneath you. Wow. <laughs> and you were hang gliding? Yeah, yeah. How, how high up were you? Uh, I don't think I was more than about, uh, they were coming in for an approach at Riverside. Wow. Now, it, do you get sucked up in the wake of that thing? How does that work? Uh, they he passed about 200 feet below me. But the thing is, you know, you're just a dot out in the sky, and here's right. this guy coming at you, and you can't figure out, you can't go up, down, or anyway. You just got to sit there and watch. Right, right. Is he going to run into you, over you, under you? And he's just, you know, just on a glide path, pass under you. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. And you don't land with wheels. You land, you just you come in. Yeah, and, just come in and right. stand up, yeah. Now you put a custom exhaust system on this thing, too, right? Yeah, oh yeah, it's all custom built. And then it's held up all these years. It's just amazing how well it, the stuff was built. Well, you know, you've got guys like over to your shop, like Para, oh, yeah, Bernard but, and stuff. But you know, the guys, those guys are hard to find. And, oh, they you are. You know, when I was a kid, guys like that were a dime a dozen that could make stuff, you know? Yeah. Now it's, it's so rare to find people who have that skill. Yeah. I think, you know, the, all the top fabrication guys have all moved back to North Carolina. Yeah. You know, you can do anything in North Carolina. I mean, it's just fabulous back there. So the whole yeah, when Southern I was, California thing, it's just not here like that we grew up yeah. with anymore. When I was down, I went to the Holman Moody shop, and that was, uh, yeah. brought back a lot of memories. So do you think when you were designing cars, it was the best era, or was there an era, another era you think would have been better? I'd like to have worked on a little bit earlier era. I think there was far more uh, passion both in engineering and, and aerodynamics. People the, didn't understand the 40s and 50s, the 30s? Yeah, right? back to the 30s. So yeah, yeah. If you look at the variety of things that were done and how beautiful that everybody was doing stuff, it's just incredible. I feel very, very fortunate to have, uh, to have been in that last era, you know, where everything was done by hand and we could still build, build cars over in Italy and build it stuff yeah, by hand. Yeah. And that's all sort of gone now. It's everything that was built. Yeah, it really has, hasn't it? I was amazed going to Goodwood, you know, last week. There's a lot greater reverence for the older cars over there than there is right. here. And, uh, you know, people do a lot on keeping them together. Peter, thanks for bringing this car. Oh, and, uh, gee, this is such a yeah, I don't know thing. why Volkswagen didn't buy this. You should have bought the Buick engine. They would have sold a million of these things. You know, there's nothing wrong with this car. A little more horsepower wouldn't fit. Oh, this thing's probably got 100,000 miles on it now. Well, yeah. it runs great. It's a lot of fun to drive. And, oh, it's uh, great. You always have the most innovative, exciting stuff. So <laughs> if a guy is retired, you got to slow down a little bit. Right, yeah. But you're pretty much working all the time, right? Right. I wouldn't know what to do if I, if I quote, retired. <laughs> but you look like you're having fun. Peter, thank you, my friend. I am great, Jay. Thank the you. The legendary Pete Brock. Always a pleasure to have him come by. Very cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs>